Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be sharing a bit of a how to play as well as my review of In Magnificent Style from Worthington Publishing. Should you charge your friendly local game store in order to get your hands on this deluxe edition of Herman Lettman's dice chucking push your luck Gettysburg game? Or even with fresh chrome, does this game not pass muster? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, today I am going to be sharing a wee bit of a how to play, as well as my review of the deluxe edition of In Magnificent Style from Worthington Publishing. This is designed by Herman Lettman with artwork provided by Tim Allen. This is a solitary game for ages 13 and up, plays in around 60 minutes, and does carry an MSRP of $75. Two things I want to mention before we jump in. First off, Herman Lutman and I are buddies. In fact, Herman's game design started getting published right about the time the gaming gang launched. So Herman and I go way back. So in the interest of transparency, I'm friends with the designer. Second, the fine folks over at Worthington Publishing were kind enough to send me this review copy, but neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any sort of other compensation for me to share my thoughts about this game with you. These days, it's important that you know that. All right, that said, let's swing on over to the other camera because I've got... In Magnificent Style, Pickett's Charge, set up. So in essence, this is a dice rolling push luck game that simulates the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, in particular, what's known as Pickett's Charge, when the forces of General Longstreet's Corps tried to shatter the center of the Union line. They were ordered to by General Robert E. Lee, Longstreet didn't think they had a chance in hell of doing it, but you didn't say no to General Lee. So his divisions went forward and uh, were slaughtered, really were. Things did not go well for Pickett, Trimble, or Pettigrew, who were the division commanders uh, who were leading that charge. Although Pickett really wasn't with his men. He was, he was in the rear all right. Anyway, so that's kind of the, the premise of the game. Component quality, really, really nice. This is a mounted board. These brigade counters, very chunky, very cool. They have this kind of overhead look of uh, miniatures to them. We'll zoom in to give you a better look at uh, like the cards and the counters and things like that as well. Should point out, this is a fairly large board especially for a solitaire game. So you're going to take up a little bit of real estate. So I've had to zoom out quite a bit to fit everything in. Normally you don't see my keyboard off to the side here, but all in all really nicely presented. We do have a, the rule book here, which surprisingly enough for a game that really boils down to some pretty simple mechanics, quite a few more pages in the rules than I would have expected. Nothing they can't wrap your head around. Like I said, this is a pretty easy game to understand. It's it's a pretty low complexity. But yeah, I was just kind of surprised. There's like 14 pages of rules. A lot of this uh, corresponds to things that might come up as events. It's not something that's always going to happen. So that is what's revealed there. So what you're going to do is you're going to track victory points. And then at the end of your five turns... You are going to tally those up, see how you've done. Historically, it was a major defeat uh, for the Confederates. And we've got an example of play as well as Herman's design notes. So 18 pages, 
like I said, about 14 pages are rules. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to start off. This is the Union line here. So before the charge, uh, the Confederate artillery under uh, Porter Alexander had bombarded the Union line. So we've got these little fire counters here that are dual sided. So we have minus one strength value. So this has a strength value of five minus one. It's a four. And we'll have 10 markers. There's nine locations. So you're going to assign one location two counters. So of course I've, I've decided to assign it to uh, the bloody angle up here, which historically is where the only place that the Confederate units actually broke through the uh, union lines momentarily. So we're going to lay those down. So what's going to happen is as our brigades advance, we're going to be able to see what were the effects of that bombardment might be a miss may have actually lowered the strength of these units here facing us. We don't know until we get to this point here, we're going to be able to start spotting, see what's going on with those as well. It's possible that we might be able to assign more of these counters. I have these over in a bowl, but what you really want to do is have these all face down and kind of mix them up a little bit and then assign them to the various units and use the extras if you need to provide more of these hits to them down here we've got the different brigades each of our brigades is going to start off with a strength of 10 we have a rally counter and then we also have our three division commanders so we have picket we have trimble and we have Pettigrew, and we also have a couple of counters that represent james longstreet which uh, these are one and done we use them and they're gone but they count just as the division general table, which tells us what we can utilize these generals each turn to do. The majority of the time, you're going to use them to re-roll these dice. When you get a really bad die roll for the unit that they're assigned to, that they're accompanying, you're going to usually use them to re-roll the dice. It is possible for them to be killed. It's possible for them to be wounded as well. So it's something to keep in mind. Also, everything we need from the game is right here on the board or in these two little sideboards. So once our, once our brigades hopefully reach the Union lines, then we go into bayonet combat. That's when we start using these dice, and it's going to tell us exactly what we need to do here. And then we've got our victory points. It'll tell us what are we getting victory points for. So what we're really trying to do here is not only are we trying to break the line and capture these locations by basically bringing this down to a strength of zero. If we capture it, we want to capture these areas uh, adjacent to each other. So it's essentially what it means is we've got, we've broken through a large portion of the center of the union lines. So easier said than done. This is not an easy game to do well at. Right off the bat, this is just, this is a very luck-driven game. Dice, you roll poorly, things are not going to go well. Roll really well, things will be much easier than you expected them to be. Got to be honest, though, to me, when things start going bad is when things get really interesting. But it's important for you to know, if you are one of these people who do not like to have luck mitigating your gameplay, dice rolls mitigating your gameplay. You do not want to come anywhere near in Magnificent Style. Just pointing that out. Something else, if you are familiar with uh, Herman Lutman's Crowbar, the Rangers at Point Du Hoc from Flying Pig Games, that is based on this system. Uh, I know some folks out there might think it's the opposite. Oh, in Magnificent Style, it's based on Crowbar because... This deluxe edition came out after. That's not the case. This came first. In fact, this was originally released by Victory Point Games. And I re I actually reviewed it back then and liked it. Uh, I gave it an 8 out of 10. But at that point in time, it was just kind of a, a desktop publishing sort of component quality from Victory Point Games. I know a lot of reviewers wouldn't touch any of their games because of that. The gaming gang, we weren't like that. Good gameplay, 
was what mattered to us. Component quality, not so much. But this has really been boosted component-wise, you know, to the nines, right? Okay, so what you're basically going to do is you're going to be sitting here, you're going to start off with a union activity phase. In the first turn, you don't do that. But normally, you're going to draw at least one card, and you're going to look at the union event. So these cards are broken into Confederate and Union sections here. And as you progress, the Union's going to get more, more events taking place. So that kind of simulates what's going on with the Union forces. There are Confederate events as well. And uh, this game is very swingy. This game is very swingy. Things can, can swing from one end to the other very, very quickly which some people will not like. It doesn't bother me. Something else I should point out is you're not making a lot of strategic decisions in this game. For example, we've got these sections and we've got these columns. So your brigades will only move up the column that they start off in. Uh, reason behind that is because you need to know which division general is assigned to those brigades, and if you start moving them all over the place, it becomes rather, rather difficult to tell. Uh, although I have to, I have to say, Armistead's division is down here, so his I shouldn't say division brigade is down there. He was actually the general who broke through up here, so at the bloody angle. So that will not happen in this game, strangely enough. But this is very abstract. This, this is not a you know super detailed simulation of the Battle of Gettysburg or Pickett's Charge during the Battle of Gettysburg. So you're going to essentially pick a division. It's going to be the one that you're going to control. And you're going to basically roll dice up until the point where you decide it's time for you to stop. Or the dice tell you you're going to stop or move backwards. So as an example, I'm going to use Fry's Brigade here. I do not have a general assigned to this brigade, so I will not have an opportunity to do anything special like re-roll dice. And we're going to move. We're hopefully going from the green to the yellow to the red. It's important that you understand we have these different sections here because different events will uh, have different effects based on where that brigade is located. So we're not even in the green yet. So we're going to roll. And of course, the worst possible result. So high on each die is what we want. Not that. So it's a route. So unit takes hits equal to half the distance to the rally point. Well, we haven't moved. So we're at the rally point. So uh, we're back in the start space anyway, so that doesn't happen. That would count for our activation. So that was a horrible die roll. And that is going to basically end the activation for Fry's Brigade. So I'm going to actually activate uh, Dick Garnett's Brigade, which is right next to it, because there are certain events that are going to allow us and certain die results that are going to allow us to make a battle line where we'll be able to move other brigades that are adjacent to our active brigade. And when we're, we're doing that, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to use this counter here just to show that this is the brigade we're using. Just in case, you know, you're in the midst and you've got brigades all over the board here and, and you, know, you answer a phone call or you, you leave for a little bit and come back, then you'll know what's going on. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I, was, I was finishing up with them. So I'm going to roll here. Okay, that's better. We get a five. So we go red side, white side. So five, three is an advance. So Dick Garnett's brigade would advance. And we're going to leave the rally marker here. Let's push our luck. Keep going. A two, four. Mm, not so great. But a two, four is in advance, so we'd advance again. So nothing bad has happened to us yet. We're going to continue to advance. Now, all of these results are right here in this chart. 
right below. This is going to tell us exactly what we get to do. All right, one more. Let's see what we got. Oh, 6-5. That's very, very good. So come on, boys. So come on, boys, is we get to move one space. And we also get to draw an event card for the Confederates. And it says, supporting second line, choose any one division, pick it, Pettigrew, or Trimble, to receive a pool of five strength equal to the current game turn number. So we're going to get one. You may distribute those strength values among units in that division, increasing their individual SV accordingly. So that's one thing to point out. You can actually have strength values higher than 10. You can have strength values higher than five. So we would get one and we would add that to, uh, for the heck of it, we're going to add it over here because the bloody angle is pretty tough to crack. So we're going to give that to Lane. So there we go. We would have that. Now we can keep rolling. I'm going to try to get us into the yellow here because then I'm going to show you what sighting does. So let's see what we get. A 5-6. Yes. Another good one. Come on, boys. Same thing. So we're going to move into here. We have taken absolutely no hits whatsoever. So we're in good shape. And we're going to get to do another Confederate event. So, so far, things are outside of this that sucked. <laughs> things are moving swimmingly. So it says Pickett's fresh division, fresh division. You can move all units in the right flank wing column one space forward, but not into an obstacle space. So we can move all units in the right flank, flank wing. That's here. They all get to move one. Including Garnet. And that would be that event there. So what I would do in this situation, we're in the yellow area. The Emmitsburg Road here, this is going to be tricky for us to get across because there was a fence along the road that the Confederate forces actually had to tear apart, get past. And during this whole point, this is about a mile and a half distance that, that these troops had to cover in pretty much open terrain uh, and that's, it was a meat grinder, basically, especially as they got closer up. And the fence along the Emmitsburg Road really slowed them down. So to get past this, you actually have to get uh, determined advance or better on your roll here. Plus, we're pretty far away from this rally marker. So as an example, if I push my luck, it's possible we could get, like, say, heavy fire. And what heavy fire does is you take hits equal to half the distance to your rally marker rounded up. So that would be pretty, pretty bad. So what I would do in this situation here is I would say, okay, you know what? I'm going to end my activation for Dick Garnett's brigade. So what we also do now, since we're in the yellow area, we can spot. So what that means is we get to see what is the effect that our bombardment prior to this advance has done. So we get to flip this over, take a look, and it says one hit. So we're going to flip that over, make it a four, and we can get rid of that. We know what it, what it was. So we know this is down to a four. And then we would move on and activate our next brigade and so on and so forth. So, uh, once again, you have opportunities here where you can form battle lines, depending if you roll good or an event, which will allow you to move more than one brigade. Like we had the event that allowed us to move these all one. What you want to try to do as you're playing is you don't want to get brigades way too far ahead of everybody, such as this. This probably is not a great finishing spot because they're so far apart. And if I, if I'm able to do a battle line in advance, they must be adjacent or one back diagonally or one ahead diagonally. So of course, keeping in mind, I have not activated them yet. So I could conceivably catch up. So what you're eventually going to do is you're going to be losing strength points. You're going to gain strength points from time to time. Usually you're going to be losing them. 
And you're going to get to this point here where hopefully before you end five turns, because that's one of the aspects you got to keep in mind too, is you got to move these brigades up. You only have five turns to do that. And you need to be able to break through the union line. So once you're able to get, say, like so, right? Let's say we got up there and we had a strength of seven. Just for the heck of it. Then we would get into our bayonet charge and we would use different modifiers for our strength and we would roll dice against each other. And then we would look at the combat results to tell us what happens. And we might lose strength. They might lose strength. We might be able to capture that if we've taken them down to zero, so on and so forth. So at the end of the game, once once you get to the end of the fifth turn, what you'll do is you're going to total up your victory points from here. And then you're going to look in the book and determine how well have you done. And that is essentially how you play the game. Once again, you get to use your generals once per turn with the brigade that they've been attached to. And there's a variety of thing, things that they can do. It's not only re-rolling dice. They can help you in bayonet charges, uh, redeploy your battle line, things like that. But the main thing you tend to do is use them to re-roll dice or help you out in the bayonet charge there uh, if they're still around it is very easy for you to lose them as well. All right. In essence, that is kind of how you're going to play in magnificent style. Let's swing on over to the other camera. I'm going to share my final thoughts and give this a review score. Well, if you're familiar with the gaming gang, you know that I like in magnificent style. When it first came out from Victory Point Games, I gave it an 8 out of 10. Really enjoyed it. Some people will hate this game. I'll be the first to point out those of you out there who want to have all these different uh, like strategic options as you're playing, all these different tactics you can utilize, this isn't going to be you know, up your alley. Those of you out there who do not like shucking dice and having you know, a, a very swingy game luck-wise won't care for this either. Uh, also, if you're looking for like a strict simulation of Pickett's Charge, no, this isn't it. This is a fun, lightweight game that tries to give you the feel of the pressure of trying to, to move these brigades forward, trying to keep them together, cohesive, so they're still a fighting unit, and face what was, in essence, just a, a killing field that they had to cross in order to reach the Union lines. I like that. This is a game that, will come down from my shelf from time to time when I'm in the mood for a solitaire game. There's no getting around it. I really do like in magnificent style. Got to say the component quality is really, really nicely done. You know, I forgot to, uh, to zoom in to give you guys a look. So let me do that right now. So you can get a better look at some of this stuff. I will zoom in as far as I possibly can. Give you a better look at the various different units, the counters. So we got Trimble, we've got Picket, we've got Pettigrew, Longstreet. Got the cards here as well. Lee's Veterans, Fence Obstacle. So that's to, to give you an idea of like the, the cool little like top down Kind of, kind of gives you a feel of like, you know, 15 millimeter minis or if you want to go really small, six millimeter miniatures. Uh, that has not changed from the original, uh, from Victory Point Games. It, it had the same kind of top-down look. Really, really like that. It's pretty cool. All right, there we go. Zoned out on that. I was like, yeah, we'll zoom in. I'll give you a better look. <laughs> but I don't. All right, so. There is something I do want to talk about with this game. And if price doesn't matter to you, and I know there are folks out there who say that, that the price of games should not come into the equation when you're doing a review. 
I disagree. I know th- some of those people are like, well, you know, games are art. And, you know, you don't put a price tag on art and yada, 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 and so forth. Now, I'm not saying that game design is not an art. It is. The actual games themselves, uh, is it's pushing it, putting it into the realm of art. So, $75 for this game, I don't see it. I really don't. That is the MSRP from Worthington Publishing. That is pricey for this game. If I remember correctly, when this was first out from Victory Point Games, and once again, completely different component quality. If I remember correctly, it was like a $30 or $35 game. It was not a real pricey game. I don't, 75 bucks is asking a lot. $75 is really asking a lot for this. When you compare it to other war games out there, even from Worthington Publishing itself. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a head scratcher. It really, really is. And I don't want to dissuade anybody from picking this game up because it's a good game. I like it. I recommend it. I just can't give it a really strong recommendation at $75. It, I just don't see it. This, to me, is more like a $50 game, maybe $55. For one, it's a solitaire game, plays in about an hour. It's it's going to play differently every time you play, mainly because of luck and, of course, because of the event cards that you, you play. But it's not going to play radically different outside of the luck factor. It's not like you're suddenly going to be like, oh, wow, I've discovered a new strategy that I can apply to In Magnificent Style. No, not at all. So I, I'm going to ding it. I am actually going to ding this because of the pricing. And I apologize to my good friend Herman for doing this. But I got to be honest. I got to tell you how I feel. So I gave the original in Magnificent Style an 8 out of 10. I still recommend the deluxe edition of in Magnificent Style. But I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 because... In my opinion, the main thing dinging this is the price. Like I said, I know people who don't like a lot of luck. Yeah, okay, fine. This this shouldn't be up their alley in the first place. So yes, on a scale of 1 to 10, I give In Magnificent Style a 7 out of 10. Recommended. I would bump that that score higher if you get it less than MSRP. So there is that. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. If you do, ding that bell. It will not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, but also tell you when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs right here on YouTube Monday through Thursday nights as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news and more. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for the latest in gaming news, reviews, as well as a whole lot more there, too. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jeff McAleer, and as I wrap up all of my videos during this never-ending pandemic, certainly hope all of you out there are being smart and staying safe. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, if you haven't subscribed to the Gaming Gang channel yet, click right here. If you'd like to see the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch, click right up there. And if you want to trust YouTube's algorithm to give you something to watch, click right there. Once again, thanks so much for watching. And everybody, please... Wear a mask.